for weeks and, and months now, I've been asking this question, kind of tearing out my hair. What, what are we doing with this whole coronavirus thing? Why is this happening? And, and just holding that whole um, question, no answers, you know, and, and then I started to, um, I got some pieces of it and, but I didn't know how the pieces fit. So last, a week ago, this, this past Sunday, Saturday, actually, um, I was talking with somebody and all of a sudden the, the window opened, <laughs> my, one of my windows opened, and, um, and the question, where are we going with this whole mask and virus business, got answered. And I could see exactly where we were going. So I, I put this little thing together thinking, you know, maybe this would be helpful for everybody. Um, so we have this coronavirus and everybody is sequestered at home. It started out being kind of voluntary and now it's getting a little more strict in some places and some people are opening up but others are locking down again or locking down worse or harder um, so here's here's where we're going the more that that people are sequestered at home the more they've had to work remotely and it was a big step I think for big corporations to allow people to work remotely because it was kind of like letting go of control. Um, big corporations have not trusted that people would work or that they would actually produce if they weren't right under somebody, some supervisor's thumb. And then there was also, you know, you can't build a car in your backyard and then ship that piece to the next backyard. So. Um, you know, being able to go to some place was necessary for some types of, of big corporate production, but not everything. A lot of stuff is paperwork. So anyways, big corporations allow people to work remotely. And in fact, you know, the word is stay home. Stay home. And people were either um, working from home or they were out of a job. So the, because people were at home uh, and working from home, a lot of people ended up buying new and better computers. And all of a sudden now, it's very difficult to get a new computer because they're sold out. And all the parts and everything are, have been coming from China. That's another whole ball of wax by itself. But the stress on internet communications and software increased greatly. And the result of that is that we are headed into new internet systems and protocols. Those new systems and protocols are going to emerge over the rest of this year and into early next year. So that's one of the first outcomes is a whole different kind of, of internet. Um, another factor, people staying at home, Unemployment went up, so many things closed. There's no jobs. When you have no jobs, people have no money. So what did the government do? They stepped in with stimulus checks, with PPP loans, um, enhanced unemployment benefits. And what does that do? That takes us or is the precursor for universal basic income. It's our first hint that that's where we're headed. UBI, universal basic income. If nobody really has any money and we just have UBI, or a lot of people do, then what do we need banks for? Banks really are only needed when everybody's transacting and using um, dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And so when banks are no longer needed, what happens next is digital and cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. So we're headed right toward that. So when there's no money, what else happens? Foreclosures go up. When foreclosures go up, because I think it's 30% of the population are not paying their rent or their mortgages, 
um, that is not good. It's so hard to catch up once you get behind. And if you don't have any money because you're at home, you're not working remotely, you're just at home out of a job, then what? What are your options then? So homelessness goes up a lot and people begin to move into tents. And from tents, they will move into tiny houses. Many people will then settle for a tiny house. So tiny house solutions get people used to living in 350 to 450 square feet. And part of the couple of the things I've read about the tiny houses are, have to do with the uh, idea that in the future, homeless people will be housed in these and they're just going to stack them and rack them. You know, you're going to get a room. A tiny house is maybe 300, 400 square feet. Uh, that's the size of a good size bedroom. That's maybe eight by 12. And a good size bathroom that might be eight by 10. And a good size closet that might be six by nine. And that's it. That's, that's what you get. That's pretty close to 350 square feet. So tiny house solutions um, come out. Lots and lots of people go for cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And, and all of a sudden, all they've got is a very small area. Um, and they have no rights, no property. They don't own anything. Um, and when you don't own anything, property taxes drop. You know, because people don't own land anymore. So property taxes uh, drop and then they go away. And once you don't own the land, then you really don't have a say in hardly anything. Then it really comes down to being sheep if you're not careful. So as, um, you know, as this whole business continues, the mask and virus business continues, uh, another major factor is that Main Street retail businesses and mall chains collapse and close. So retail just takes a terrible, terrible hit. There's, Amazon, of course, is the beneficiary there. Um, because all retail purchases end up being online. And so the .com, .net, .biz, .org um, kind of proliferation of online businesses is massive and everybody is selling online. So when everything is closed and all ordering is done online, there's no reason to go out. There's no reason to go out because everything is closed. So what happens then when there's no reason to go out? Well, why own a car if there's no reason to go out, if everything is closed? And this is actually something that the robes said on page 185. People would try to hang onto their cars and sometimes families would maintain a car for a while, but eventually people would let go of that whole thing. So when you don't have cars, why do you need car insurance? Car insurance becomes not necessary. Um, when you don't have car insurance and registration and title and all of that, um, Secretary of State offices close because there's no registration or licenses needed. All information goes into the blockchain, all of it. So without cars, parking lots close. And I don't, I don't know how much land is taken up in some of the big cities uh, with parking, either parking facilities or big expansive parking lots, but it's a lot. And when you have urban parking facilities and lots closed, they end up, they don't just sit there. I mean, they might for a year or two, but then they're gonna be repurposed. And new housing or entirely new business districts will be built on old parking lots. And many of the big cities at their core were built, I'm gonna say a couple hundred years ago, they need all new water, all new plumbing, 
all new electricity, all new everything. Um, and so the idea of being able to rebuild a city in the core of that same city and, and be able to do it using new technology, new materials, new everything, that's a pretty attractive option for a lot of city planners and um, people who run big cities. Um, however, big city, without cars, why do you even need a city if everybody's working at home? So I don't know that big business districts are gonna be built, but they are planning to put new housing up where a lot of those parking lots were. So without a car, um, without having to go out to work, what happens with people? They begin searching for other alternatives. And that leads then right into the development of family business neighborhoods where people live and work together. And the Robes talked about that on page 110. And family business neighborhoods were not necessarily blood related people. They were people who had like minds. They were people who had a similar or complementary set of skills. And they came together and said, we could produce this. We could, we could make that. And that's where the lessons from the old corporations really came in. Corporations were uh, very productive in their day, but the bigger thing, the more important thing that they taught us was how to coordinate a project and get it built, get it done and uh, across big regions. And so that lesson of how to work together with others and coordinate without you know, a ton of overhead and thousands of employees, that's the big payoff from those former corporations. So meanwhile, um, cars, buses, trucks, tractors, planes, drones, etc., all are becoming electric vehicles and not just electric, but autonomous driving vehicles. So electric vehicles are known as EVs, electric vehicle, and autonomous vehicles are AVs, autonomous driving. Um, and so what, when people don't have cars or can't really afford to maintain paint a car, why would they need to if they're not going anywhere? They still need to go out here and there, travel a little bit. And so what we will see are the development of these vehicle fleets that provide all transport. You'll call up a car and you'll order a car to go wherever you want to go and it'll show up. It'll be an electric autonomous driving vehicle. Um, and so when you have all these electric autonomous vehicles, uh, what happens next is that the interstate highway system is reconfigured around um, EV, AV lanes and new zoning. So that gets rebuilt, reorganized, redone. Another thing that occurs is that road maintenance ends in some areas. Why? Because there just aren't enough cars. So um, and we're seeing that here in Michigan, uh, in a lot of places, just the roads are in terrible condition. Um, and some roads that were paved, they just let go back to, to dirt or gravel. So as road maintenance ends, because there aren't enough cars in a lot of areas, uh, the result is going to be that suburbs are no longer viable. Without nearby retail, cars and goods roads, what do you need a suburb for? So the suburbs only developed when we worked in one place and lived in another. When we're living and working in the same place, the whole idea of a suburb goes away. Um, and there are also um, many, many zoning changes in cities, suburbs, and rural areas that come about as a result of this. Zoning commissions um, try to get um, different results. They try to mandate different um, things that can be done with various pieces of property that will conform to what they're trying to do. And what they will be trying to do 
in many cases is get as many people as they can into these big super cities that are, um, could be, not saying that there's a lot of thought going into these, or there's not a lot of information about these yet, but there are some uh, projects that million, a million resident city, all organic, all natural, uh, beautifully sculpted, et cetera. Um, it looks nice on paper. I'm not sure how it would work out. Um, so anyway, continuing on, where does this mask and virus business take us? Um, oil demand drops when there's hardly any cars, and we've already seen that. When you don't have cars and you don't have to go out to work, then the demand for gas and oil just falls through the floor. And new forms of energy, construction, materials, and manufacturing appear as a response to that. And we do have new energies and new technologies waiting in the wings, and we have had them for a long time, but there have been an average of about 700 patents per year that have been uh, forbidden to, for anybody to do anything with them because they are a threat to national security, quote unquote. And really, from my point of view, they're just a threat to the security, the economic security of some other corporation. But um, what happens when oil drops through the floor is now it, it creates the space and the excuse for a lot of new energies to come forward. So the result of that is heating, cooling, electrical systems, all of those change as new energies emerge. And, and a whole new infrastructure gets built out to deliver new forms of power. So another thing is new home designs, new construction tools and materials emerge and new locations for homes become very attractive. When you have new energy that can be delivered some other way than besides through poles and wires, um, when you have areas that were um, very, very expensive to get water or to produce um, ventilation or air conditioning or heat, uh, you have many, many more options then. So, and all kinds of new areas become livable that were not livable before. And we already see a huge migration out of the big cities, um, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, a lot of big cities. People are just moving somewhere, anywhere to be out of the big city. So another thing that occurs this mask and virus business is taking us um, into a, a place or a time where agriculture in its present form collapses as oil supply drops and prices rise. Um, it's not very well known. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but some years ago um, in, when permaculture was first coming out, uh, the big permaculture manual um, Bill Mollison said that $9 worth of oil to produce $1 worth of food. And I was like, how is that it's sustainable? That isn't. And so what, what we have coming um, with this whole mask and virus business and people don't want anybody else touching their food, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to have to grow your own. And so the indoor growing wall, the indoor kitchen appliance that is set up like a small kitchen garden, um, those kinds of, of uh, new tools, new uh, ways of getting food are going to proliferate. So the, you know, and right now the indoor growing wall is hot. It's a hot item. There are an entire multi-story buildings that are being set up as indoor growing systems with artificial light, with um, artificial wind, with sprinkler systems, high nutrition, high density food can be grown in those. Um, that's gonna result in not only new foods, 
being available in a lot of places, but dietary changes that will spread among the population. When you have access to foods that you couldn't get in, um, in the, using the former agriculture, uh, the result is going to be that uh, your whole way of eating and cooking is going to change. And that changes our health across the board. So as the mask and virus lockdown, the business closures, and fading travel by car continues, what we'll also see is doctors and dentists close or struggle with very difficult restrictions. And what we'll have is virtual doctor visits, virtual diagnoses and prescriptions. Now this is already happening in China. China a long time ago decided there was no way they were gonna come up with one doctor for every 100 people that they have. They have 1.4 billion people. And so they started uh, really pushing this whole idea of virtual medicine. Um, one of the things I've seen with uh, robes uh, is you put your hand in uh, this little kind of an energy um, gadget and it diagnoses your energy. And uh, if it needs more information, you just pick your finger and you put that blood on a little slide and you put that in that little energy gadget and that diagnoses everything that's going on in your body. And then what you get is a prescription printout and that prescription is um, multidisciplinary. So what we're gonna see is hospitals and clinics shrink or close. Some of them are closing already. The prescriptions are gonna include nutrition, herbs, rife technology, homeopathy, naturopathy, um, dietary recommendations of all sorts, um, fasting, exercise, etc. So multidisciplinary medicine is going to appear. And that is especially going to um, pave the way for frequency medicine. And frequency medicine then paves the way for life extension. So one of the things that Dr. Levengood um, did part of his research was discovering what are the effects of electromagnetic frequencies on a population of fruit flies, for instance. And what he discovered was that he could indefinitely postpone their maturation. They just kept going. Um, he could, it, I mean, that was just part of the process. He could delay their maturation so they never reached a uh, reproductive age or stage. He could speed it up. He could get them to be way more productive or he could end their life prematurely. We are frequency beings and we will be learning a lot about how to extend life using frequency medicine. So another factor with the mask and virus lockdown. Salons, spas, and tattoo services, and everybody who does that kind of thing is going to close as well or already has. And the result of that is that home-based spas proliferate and they become part of the personal care of our culture. That's really an important piece. Um, as personal care changes, fashions and trends in personal appearance change. And so we'll have maybe a different look that we think is beautiful. And, uh, and then home design and construction include hair and spa facilities. People want their own place where a hairdresser can come in or as family business neighborhoods come together, there may be somebody in that community who cuts hair, who gives permanence, who colors hair, who does all sorts of beauty treatments and spa-like things. And so um, houses are gonna include those things so that whoever in the family specializes in that or in the group, um, is able to have the kind of facilities they need. So another thing, 
Universities and schools close. Parents are at home because schools and daycare are closed. When that occurs, oh my, <laughs> um, no sports or athletic scholarships are available. Where, where are you gonna go and, and do your sports thing? Um, virtual education is available everywhere and has really, uh, really become a topic of great discussion a lot of difficulty around that this year. However, personalized education becomes standard education, and that's a very good thing. When you have one teacher trying to teach 30 or 40 children, and, and she's got a certain amount of material that she has to cover because the school said so, and a certain number of tests that she has to administer because the school said so, and then there are these tests that, that test how well the teacher is doing. All of that amounts to, um, if you happen to be one of those children who learns using kinesthetic methods and your teacher teaches using visual methods, you're lost. If you happen to be auditory and she or he teaches using visual methods, you're lost. And so personalized education becomes standard. And that's actually something I've wanted for a long, long time. Back when I was an educational consultant, we used to talk about um, why would we try to teach this to this child when it's obvious that their gifts are going in another direction? Why don't we focus on the gift that the child is displaying instead of asking the child to conform? And so virtual education makes that possible, home-based schooling, Homeschooling is, uh, makes that all possible. And what we have that results from that is virtual reality learning systems emerge. And an example of, of old education systems is um, you have to learn your ABCs. Um, what is that? Reading, writing, arithmetic. You, that's absolutely standard. And in virtual learning systems, the teacher might say something like, okay, class, today we will visit Egypt and explore the great Nile River. A whole different approach to education and the possibilities for uh, developing connections between different parts of the country are just astounding, or different parts of the world. Building bridges between uh, various cultures, building understanding. Wow, the teacher's dream. So a couple other things that, um, that we have here, where are we going with this mask and virus business? If oil drops, uh, we may experience a period of time in which there's uh, no polyester or ni uh, nylon uh, kinds of fabrics because those are based in oil. Um, and, and I think that oil is going to drop and then we're going to use up our stores of oil and then the price is going to rise and at some point there'll be a small amount of oil. It'll be expensive because it's not going to be the norm anymore. But um, in that period when the fabrics change, clothing and fabric selection will also change. So, um, and another thing affecting clothing is there will be a migration to different climate areas, and that will trigger changes, a lot of changes in the kinds of clothing that are in demand. If a lot of people leave the big cities in the Northeast that experience really severe hard winters, and they all move to the Sun Belt, that's going to change the whole balance of the kind of clothing and the kinds of fabrics that need to be produced. And clothing for local climate needs, mittens, those kinds of things may become specialty um, products in different climate areas. So it's an opportunity there for people to, um, you know, to be able to start up a little business of their own. Uh, another thing that happens with this mask and virus business, and we're seeing this already also, theaters, bars, convention centers, sports arenas, gyms, et cetera, close. So when that happens, we have no movies. 
no movie stars. We have no concerts and no plays. We have no dance events and, and no sports to other than what you know they put on on the on YouTube. And um, and when that happens, if we have no movie stars and we have no big rock and roll or other famous people or um, we don't have dance or sports or um, you know that kind of thing what we're going to find is that new heroes emerge um, the question being wow you know might the next new hero be a scientist or a geologist or something something else altogether so the bottom line is it's a whole new world so let me sum all of this up okay so um where are we going with this mask and virus business we're going to new internet system and protocols universal basic income digital and crypto and blockchain systems an online economy personal cars go away, new cities being built, family business neighborhoods developing, fleets of electric and autonomous vehicles, oil is no longer our main energy, new home designs, new locations for homes develop, new forms of agriculture, new forms of medicine, life extension widely available, education is online and highly personalized, clothing and fashion change, new forms of entertainment, and new heroes emerge. I would close by saying a lot of these things you could look at, if, let me go to the automobile. We don't have an automobile, so therefore you don't have a driver's license, so therefore you don't um, have a registration. How do we identify who's here? Is that the reason for the chip push to get everybody chipped, et cetera? Um, those are the kinds of questions that we are going to have to answer. Do we need to identify everybody who's here? Do we need to have a count, a census? Or is that just something that the government needs? And speaking of governments, I didn't put it in here, but um, the government shrinks quite a bit. And I will say something, and I want to talk with Daphne at some point about the kind of government that I've seen in the future, it's nothing like what we have, um, but a lot of it is online and it functions a little bit differently. So um, the question with all of these things, new internet, universal basic income, um, the downside of, of UBI is perhaps that um, you cannot uh, you cannot speak up or you, you're not really free to do and go where you want because they'll cut your income off. So that's a downside of that. Um, digital, crypto, blockchain, what happens if we lose power? Where's all our money then? Um, online economy, same thing. Internet, absolutely required. Um, cars, all, the cars when we no longer have personal cars, we don't have as much freedom to move around. It cuts into freedom a lot. How is that going to settle with us? So uh, family business neighborhoods might have some really good things about them. Fleets of electric and autonomous vehicles. We'd still be able to move around, but every move you make would be able to be tracked, et cetera. It really is now, but we don't feel that as strongly as we think we would feel the electric and autonomous vehicle tracking. Um, new home designs and new locations, uh, all of that would, you know, if you're living in a, 
what is it, a tiny home, would you even have an option or an opportunity to build one of the new homes out of some of the new um, bio, I forget what it's called, bio, um, not biodegradable. There's a new, there's new kinds of, of building materials that are out there. Um, new forms of agriculture. Would you even want to be in a city crammed in there with a million people um, without being able to grow your own food and have at least that kind of security? Uh, same with the medicine, um, life extension. Do you want to live longer? If you're miserable, why would you want to prolong the misery? If we have life extension available, then are we also going to have um, um, early death approved of by choice? Like I'm done with this, I want out of here, that kind of thing. Um, education, online and personalized. Um, that actually I think could be a very good thing. Although some people might not get any education um, the rest, clothing and fashion change, new forms of entertainment, new heroes, um, all of those are just different. Here's, the, here's the, the bottom line with all of this. There's a downside and there's an upside in these changes. The downside is what occurs if we do not raise our voice and have some input into where this mask and virus business is taking us. If we want to have a world that is on the upside of all of these things, and some of them are wonderful, then we need to speak now. We need to be involved now, locally, finding out who you're with, who's around you, who supports what you think, who thinks like you think, who doesn't, how, how rabid or how adamant are they, um, to have their way, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of, of uh, working through of the issues, but the time for uh, the voices to be raised is now. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that the rest is up to us. And what I want you to be aware of as you decide, are you gonna speak? Are you gonna stand? Are you gonna get involved? is that these changes are happening over this next decade. This is when our voices are needed. This is when our participation is needed. It's the, we, this is the participatory reality system and that is a critical factor to keep in mind. A decade gives us a little bit of time to adjust. It gives us a little bit of time to institute something and then evaluate it and say, Oh, that's working great. Or, ooh, uh, we need to do something different there. That didn't work like we thought it would. Um, and so we have some time, this period of time, very, very important. We may even have two decades, um, but the, the deep, if we don't stand now, if we don't get involved now, then the um, deeper side, the, the side that's not so, the downside, <laughs> if I can say it that way, may end up becoming entrenched. And to say, well, I'm going to see how things work out, and then maybe I'll say something. No, 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 no. That is way too late at that point. So um, just as you look at this next decade, this is 2020, and as you move ahead and you see where do you want to be? What kind of world do you want to live in? What sorts of wonderful things could you maybe just pick one thing and just, you know, encourage the people around you to help you bring that one thing into reality, into fruition, into manifestation, whatever words you want to use for it. Make that one thing happen. And, and if, if we can spend the next decade putting this new uh, world together, the result is that we're gonna end up being new humans with a whole new set of skills, a whole new set of perceptions, and a whole new life, a whole new world.